Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Let me give you, anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. A State of the Union address turns into a negotiation on the House floor. President Biden says Social Security and Medicare are under threat from Republicans, but Republicans claim that's not their intention. Washington correspondent Hannah Brandt digs into the debate. President Biden traveled down to the Sunshine State to deliver a heated attack. The very idea the senator from Florida wants to put Social Security and Medicare in the chopping block every five years, I find to be somewhat outrageous. He's a complete liar. But the president says he's got proof. 12-point American Rescue Plan. Reading right from Senator Scott's proposal. All federal legislation is such that's every five years. If the law is worth keeping, the Congress can pass it all over again. But Senator Scott argues the president is mischaracterizing his plan. In my plan, I also said Congress ought to tell the American public how they're going to preserve them because what we know right now is both Medicare and Social Security going bankrupt. Senator Scott tells me the goal of his proposal is to protect essential programs like Social Security and Medicare by forcing Congress to reduce federal spending in other places. If you want to save Medicare and Social Security, which I want to do, get rid of the waste. And Republicans, including Senator Scott, say they won't raise the debt ceiling until Congress agrees to spending cuts. In a responsible manner to balance our budget. Democrat Senator Tim Kaine says they should raise the debt limit, then discuss cuts separately. The right way to negotiate about spending is in the budget, not threatening to default on our credit card bill. But Senator Scott insists they do both at the same time. To make sure we preserve Medicare and Social Security and we figure out how to get our fiscal house in order. In Washington, I'm Hannah Brandt. And joining me now from Washington is a Democrat from Illinois' 8th Congressional District, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy. Welcome back to the show, Congressman. Good to see you. Hey, great to see you, Paul. Thank you. So the president spent much of his speech talking about the economy, a significant amount where he has a lot of good news to brag about. But there was a lot of talk about, uh, not a lot of talk, I should say, about the border. And that's a focus of Republicans. Is it that the economic message is something the president thinks will resonate better? I think the economic issue is the one that we hear the most about when we talk to constituents. Um, and I think that, you know, tackling the issue of, you know, making sure that we protect, preserve, protect and preserve Social Security and Medicare is top of mind uh, for a lot of Americans right now. The, there was a lot made of the jeers and the booing. And remember the first time it happened when Congressman Joe Wilson yelled out, you lied to President Obama in 2009. And now it just seems to be more of a free for all. I'm just sort of curious, does this say anything about the respect that the president of the United States commands and needs to command in front of the House? Yeah, I think that was a total lack of decorum. And I, I was very um, disturbed to see, you know, folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene just yell out and heckle uh, whenever she disagreed. And I think that just um, uh, really kind of coarsens the dialogue and makes it harder to find bipartisan solutions to really challenging uh, problems. On the other hand, I thought that the president handled it very well. I was there in the chamber, and I got to tell you that uh, it seemed like he had parried nicely with them and was able to uh, at least come to a, at least a temporary resolution where we all decided we were going to try to preserve and protect Social Security and Medicare and of course gave a standing ovation for all seniors. Yeah, that wasn't in the script I noted and I thought that was that was a pretty slick move. Uh, your guest at the State of the Union was uh, human rights activist Rushan Abbas. Why? That's right. Uh, she is a activist for Uyghurs um, and she was actually no nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Um, her sister is in a prison in the People's Republic of China because of her outspoken criticism of the Chinese Communist Party's persecution of the Uyghur people. And so I brought her uh, because of her um, incredible eloquence and because of her outspokenness with regard to human rights for people everywhere. 
So we know that the debt ceiling is upon us. Early June is when we actually run out of money in this process. And the president solidified, uh, I think, during the State of the Union as well, that upcoming negotiations won't be now about Social Security or Medicare. Republicans are on board with that. Assuming Republicans don't want to cut the military either, if my calculations are right, that leaves about 15 percent of discretionary spending. Where exactly are the cuts going to come from? I don't know. Um, I'd like to see them actually listed out by the other side, because right now, uh, it just seems like uh, they are talking about random cuts. Um, but with regard to the debt ceiling, that's a very serious issue, Paul, which you already know about. Um, raising the debt ceiling enables the U.S. government to pay past bills that have already been incurred. And so not raising the debt ceiling would be akin to a national dine and dash, uh, which would be catastrophic for the full faith and credit of the dollar. And I would argue that it would wreck the economy. So you are the ranking member of the new China Select Committee. Congratulations on that appointment. Um, mm -hmm. And so let's talk about that, that balloon that, that was flying around. Um, we've learned that, that that thing actually had communications gathering ability. This was not a weather balloon, as we were led to believe. And in an interview with Telemundo, the president said that the spy balloon was not a major breach. The White House said initially this was about making sure people didn't get hurt on the ground if we shot it down. Later it was about, well, we didn't want to provoke a major conflict with China. You're on the committee. You know more than any of us. Can you clear it up? Well, first of all, I have to say that the balloon was a brazen violation of our sovereignty um, just days before Secretary Blinken was to visit Beijing. And so kind of an outstanding question is, uh, did the folks at the top of the leadership know about this balloon at the time that Blinken was almost on his way to Beijing, or did they not? In which case, the right hand didn't know what the left hand is doing in the Chinese Communist Party. Either way, it's a disturbing scenario. Um, as far as what the president did, I thought he handled it well. Um, you know, I think that the military leaders explained their reasoning during a classified briefing uh, just two days ago. Uh, and I, uh, quite frankly, I give deference to their judgment, given that they are on the ground and in the air about what to do. And uh, I respectfully think that we should all give them deference on uh, matters like this, uh, as opposed to, you know, wildly speculating about what should be done or not done based on incomplete information. Just a brief follow up. Is there any concern you have that China did pick up in their communications activities in the days before we shot it down that they got valuable information? No, I, I did not. I did not believe that to be true based on what I learned during the classified briefing and what we know about what uh, our military leaders did to protect our secrets, as well as uh, information that the balloon might otherwise have tried to collect. Uh, I know the president also in his State of the Union was pushing for a ban on assault weapons. Um, you have actually introduced a bill that called the Cool Off Act. You're hoping might have some uh, possibilities. Talk about that. Yeah, basically what it does is it requires a, um, a brief um, kind of pause, uh, a cool off period uh, between the time someone purchases a gun and the time that they receive it in order to basically cool off crimes of passion and even thoughts of suicide. It's been shown uh, by a study by the Harvard Business School to uh, dramatically reduce suicides and homicides by double digits. The reason why we know this is because such a cool off period was actually in place at one time in many states uh, about 20 years ago. And so, uh, and it's uh, actually in several states even today. And so this has been shown to reduce homicides and suicides, and it seems like a natural um, a bipartisan measure that doesn't prevent people from getting access to firearms uh, for hunting and uh, sportsmanship and so forth. Uh, but it does uh, reduce those crimes of passion. Uh, just about 15 seconds for this question. It's a Republican-controlled House. Is it your sense of, that the agenda has changed? Will anything actually get done in this term? Um, I, I think things have to get done, Paul, whether it's reauthorizing the FAA, uh, funding the government, or raising the debt ceiling. Those are vital functions that we must get done. As far as beyond that, I think that we will have measures with regard to the Chinese Communist Party, whether it's through my committee or otherwise, that we can do on a bipartisan basis. And then, of course, as I've told you on programs before when I've been with you, 
Uh, one of my passions in, in Congress is workforce development, skills-based education, more resources for apprenticeships, and so forth. I think that's another area where, uh, especially in this tight labor market, um, I think that Republicans and Democrats can come together and um, do something positive. Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, thank you so much for your time as always, sir. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. All right, coming up next, turning to the race for mayor. What incumbent Lori Lightfoot says about her relationship with city council as several aldermen endorsed her opponents. Stay with us.